Hi, my name is Joe Glover, and I'm the Assistant Director of Statewide Veteran Services. I'm here today to talk about um, the introduction to filing a claim for benefits. There's really five different main pathways for filing a claim for benefits. So we're going to talk about those today, uh, what that entails, and um, what the VA is going to look for for a successful claim. When establishing a service-connected disability, uh, percentages will vary depending on the uh, particular condition. However, um, most of the time, it will start off at 0% and work its way forward. Uh, there's a common misperception out there that 0% is not a percentage, and that's actually not true. Uh, it's just that they're just uh, VA is saying you do have a disability. It's just not bad enough that they would want to or be able to compensate you for that. Now, the five different pathways to service connection, and we're going to unpack each one of these directly, but um, the first is direct, and then secondary, aggravation, presumptive, and then 1151. So let's look at direct. Direct means that somebody was injured in the service on active duty, and that particular disability or that injury has resulted in a disability that is still with them today. So, um, you know, some examples can be uh, I was exposed to loud gunfire while I was in the service, and it, it left me with ringing in the ears, tinnitus, and I still have that tinnitus to this day. Uh, that's a very normal claim for a veteran service officer or for a veteran to file for. The um, direct, we just have to really show that something indeed happened to you in service. Uh, that's really the core of that. And um, and then it's still with us today. So even if you were you were injured in the service, but now it's resolved itself and there's no lingering disability, you would not be able to file. Now, secondary. Secondary conditions are anything, anything that is a result of a primary direct disability. So some obvious ones, let's say you have a veteran who maybe uh, hurt their foot or their ankle. And because of hurting their foot or their ankle, now they walk with an agitated gait. Walking with an agitated gait can mean that it'll throw off your alignment, and now maybe you have a hip or a low back condition. So that um, that hip or that low back condition, of course, you never injured that during the service, but that doesn't mean that you don't have a disability today. That does somehow trace its lineage back to military service. So that's when we would look at secondaries. Some very, very common secondaries are, um, like I said, um, low back, but also one that is um, overlooked a lot of times is uh, mental health and depression. Mental health and depression, if you're a veteran who, or have a, know a veteran who is, um, because of their physical ailments they suffered in the military, are now uh, suffering from depression or some from mental health, you know, dealing with those, those physical issues, uh, that can be a very, very tough thing. And uh, absolutely, do not overlook uh, the possibility of depression or mental health condition as a secondary. Now, the one tricky part with secondary claims is you have to have the first claim. You have to have the, the first direct condition. Without that first direct condition, it, a secondary claim is going to fall apart. It just simply, if they deny the first, it, they will deny the second. They won't even look any further into it. So you do have to have that. Aggravated is commonly done when a veteran has um, something pre-existing to service, and they come in with a waiver. So um, it can be anything. A lot of, uh, you know, military members were athletes in high school, and maybe um, they came in with a known condition. Maybe they injured themselves uh, in a ball field somehow, and they came in with a waiver on that. Um, the tricky part with an aggravated claim is we just have to show that it has progressed. It has progressed due to military service, so beyond natural age progression. That's, uh, that's the only real trick with aggravated claims. But otherwise, if we can say, well, 
you know, this individual was a pitcher for their high school baseball team, and um, so they have a, they came in with a waiver on their shoulder. And now because their military service made it uh, significantly worse, um, you can file for that as an aggravated claim. That's how that works. Okay, presumptives. Now, by now, if you are listening to this video, uh, you are probably familiar with either Agent Orange or possibly Gulf War illness, something along those lines, uh, the burn pit registries. The way that these work is uh, our veteran has to have a certain condition and have to have served in the right place at the right time, or wrong place at wrong time, depending how you look at it. If a, if a veteran served in, in country Vietnam and was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, this would be a presumptive claim. A presumptive claim says uh, the VA has conceded there are certain conditions that no matter um, the details of your life, as long as you served in a particular area, have that disease, uh, the VA will uh, service connect condition. So um, you can see on the screen there, diabetes, Agent Orange, service in Vietnam, and when they went. So this particular veteran hypothetically would have served in Vietnam in December of 1972. Uh, and that's really the crux of it. There's a, there's a whole host of conditions out there that the VA has conceded for Agent Orange, for Gulf War. Um, you can look those up individually. You can talk to a veteran service officer about them. Uh, from time to time, they do add different conditions, but some common ones like with Agent Orange are lung cancer, ischemic heart disease, uh, type 2 diabetes, things like that. If you are suffering from one of those and you believe you were exposed to Agent Orange, please, please uh, file that claim or better, visit a veteran service officer to help uh, file that claim for you. And this is really just kind of the concept behind it. So the inside the bubble, outside the bubble. So uh, again, what I was saying there, we have a veteran diagnosed prostate cancer, proof of Agent Orange exposure, that's going to be service connected. The, um, where it falls apart is if we have um, no proof of this exposure. Or you know, uh, another common one is prediabetes. Prediabetes is not diabetes. So if somebody is diagnosed with prediabetes, we're not able to file that claim. Uh, well, you're not able to get service connected for it. The Blue Water Navy Bill uh, was signed into law on June 25th, 2019 by President Trump. And when that went into effect, what it did was it said that any veteran who served in the Navy and their ship was stationed within 12 nautical miles of the shoreline of the Republic of Vietnam, uh, those individuals are now a part of, or are eligible to file and receive compensation for disabilities related to Agent Orange exposure. It's the first time ever in history that this has been the case. Uh, so the trick is with these is 12 nautical miles. So if you have a um, situation where the veteran was maybe not within 12 nautical miles, but they maybe they went to Yankee Station and they sat at Yankee Station. Um, that's not within 12 nautical miles of the Republic of Vietnam, and you would not be eligible to uh, receive compensation. So we have to put you down or get to the point where we can uh, put your ship on, with, on this path within 12 nautical miles of the shoreline. Uh, there's a website that tracks all these, and so uh, a you know, veteran service officer can help you with that and walk you through to see if, if your ship uh, was on that list. And what this also did was, um, beyond what the three things that are listed here, is it opens the opportunity for survivor claims too. Uh, so if a veteran who, while they were alive, uh, did not receive compensation for this because this was not a part of the law at the time, but now they've passed and there's a surviving spouse. Now uh, that surviving spouse uh, is eligible to file for these benefits as well. So that's also something to keep in mind. Finally, as we round the horn here, uh, 1151. An 1151 claim is uh, 
medical, it's similar to a medical tort. It's a medical injury that has resulted by negligence, lack of proper skill, error in judgment, carelessness, those sorts of things under VA care. So um, it's not just enough to say, um, I went in for a surgery and on my back, and now I have a bad bag. Well, that's not negligence. That's not lack of proper skill, necessarily. Uh, it has to go beyond reasonable risk. And that's the key to winning an 1151 claim. 1151 says that a scalpel nicked a nerve, and now you have permanent nerve damage. And that is not something reasonable for a doctor to have done. Or um, it, it's you know act, it, it's it's beyond reasonable risk. That's the key to an 1151. One thing that is not 1151 eligible scars, and this is a prime example of what is not 1151. If somebody goes in for a surgery, of course they're going to have a scar. Um, so that scar is a very natural, normal part of a surgery. And you could not say, well, this this scar is painful, and I wish to be compensated for that. Unfortunately, that's not a part of an 1151 claim. Now, if that back condition uh, that they have the surgery on is service-connected, and now they have a scar because of the surgery, and that scar is painful, that could be filed as a secondary, but not as an 1151. So just a different way of looking at it, but it's service-connectable, potentially. But, for example, if a veteran went in for surgery on the right knee and then they messed up and they put it on, they did the surgery on the left knee instead, um, that would be 1151, that kind of concept, beyond reasonable risk. In order to lock in your earliest possible effective date, what um, the VA has given us a mechanism, and that is called an intent to file. An intent to file is, think of it um, almost as a bookmark. It gives the veteran the chance to say, I'm going to be submitting something, but I'm not ready to yet. That, uh, that gives us a um, chance to develop the claim, look into getting medical records, things like that. Um, and when you do file that claim, as long as it's within 365 days of previously submitting that intent to file, then it locks it in just as if you had filed that original date. So. That's, uh, that's the best way to do that. Strongly encourage you to lock in that intent to file if you are on the fence or even thinking about it. At the end of the 365 days, let's say you just decide that you're not ready to file that claim yet, that intent to file just goes away. It just disappears into the sunset, and, um, and then your timer starts over. So there really is no harm in submitting an intent to file uh, as you are working through developing evidence. Um, and with that one, uh, the earliest possible effective date is when you actually submit the claim. So uh, even if you were being treated for this condition, but you never filed that claim, until you actually file that claim or that intensive file, you are going to be locked in. Okay, that is it. Those are the five different pathways to service connection. Um, and thanks so much for listening. Uh, for any questions, please reach out to us, uh, our email, or vetsbenefit at odva.state.or.us. Uh, we constantly monitor that, and we'll be corresponding with you, helping you get linked up with a veteran service officer, answer any questions you might have, um, and appreciate your time. Thanks so much.